Okay, so we've been looking uh, in broad uh, outline at how phonological alternations work. This is when the same uh, morpheme with the same underlying representation in the lexicon uh, or in the input to the phonology ends up having more than one possible output or surface form depending on the phonological context in which it occurs. Um, and we're uh, going to spend the rest of this uh, week just uh, having uh, a detailed look at a whole bunch of alternations and how they work. Um, so I'm going to start out with some fairly simple ones. Uh, the examples in this section are cases of nasal place assimilation, which is possibly the single most common phonological process in all of the world's languages. Um, that said, not every single language has nasal place assimilation, but uh, a huge proportion of all languages have some version of this phonological process. So I thought it was worth uh, looking at a couple cases of how this works out. Um, and we'll start with the Koasati example here. Um, so for each of these, it's a good idea to try to go through the steps that I've given you in the sort of outline of how to attack these problems and see if you can get the broad answer uh, before I go through them on the board. Um, so in uh, this first case, Koasati, what we have here is a bunch of nouns in some kind of a plain form and some sort of a one singular possessive form. So this would be, for instance, the first one would be the difference between shadow and my shadow or something like that. Um, and so again, the first step as always here is going to be morphological segmentation. Uh, so given that we're seeing a bunch of uninflected followed by inflected forms, uh, likely what we're going to be targeting in this problem is that inflectional morpheme. Otherwise, this would be a weird way to set the problem up. Um, and so the question here is going to be, well, based on these paired forms, uh, what kind of a morpheme is the one singular possessive morpheme in Kawasati? So quickly try to answer that question. What I'm seeing here is that uh, the one singular possessive forms look a lot like the noun forms on the left, except they have a uh, vowel ah and some sort of a nasal segment at the left edge that wasn't there in the plain forms. Therefore, it looks like the underlying representation uh, of the one singular possessive is going to be a prefix. It's going to have an ah vowel, and then there's going to be some sort of a nasal. Uh, but here's where we run into some interesting stuff. It looks like this affix, this prefix, is alternating. That, it has, uh, that is, it has multiple uh, surface forms. Um, and the next step then is going to be, well, let's track uh, what differs between these forms and the context in which they occur. And it looks like the only thing that differs is the place of articulation of that nasal. So let's track where these different ones occur. Um, first of all, what are the variants we find of the, the final nasal in this prefix? Well, I see a labial one. Uh, I see a coronal one. I see uh, anything else? Uh, oh, I see a palatal one. That's a palatal nasal, nya. Um, and I see anything else? Oh, I see a velar one. Just one case of that. Angma. Okay, so these are the, uh, the allomorphs. Well, sorry, these are the final segments of the allomorphs. The full allomorph here would have an a in front of it. So am, an, an, ang. Uh, <clears throat> but I'm just putting these final segments because that's the only thing that differs here. Um, and now the next question, which context do each of these occur in? Obviously, the preceding context is not going to be relevant here. It's always ah for all of these forms because that's in the morpheme. That's in the underlying representation of the prefix, presumably. So what we're really interested in is the following phonological context. Uh, where do we find this ma uh, morph, uh, allomorph? Well, uh, we find it before an A vowel, uh, before an E vowel, before another A vowel, another E vowel, um, before a labial stop pa. Uh, any other cases? We find it before a labial stop v. Uh, and it looks like that's it. Um, what about this uh, coronal uh, allomorph? Well, where do we see that one on? Oh, before a coronal voiceless stop, uh, before anything else, another voiceless coronal stop. Uh, looks like that's it, just that voiceless coronal stop. Uh, where do we find the palatal nya one? Well, we find it before 
looks like a post alveolar or possibly palatal affricate cha. Um, and what else here? Uh, the, the velar nasal uh, looks like we're finding before the velar stop ka. Anywhere else? Looks like that's it. So this is our chart here. Um, and indeed, you can see that there's going to be something phonologically predictable here because you never get, uh, you know, different forms preceding the same consonant. It looks like every following consonant has a unique allomorph that it selects. Um, what do these have in common? Well, it looks like place of articulation is changing in the nasal. What are the places of articulation of these following consonants? Well, velar, velar non-anterior coronal, non-anterior coronal. This is technically palatal and this is post-alveolar, but you know, that might just be a notational thing. In any case, they're both going to be minus anterior. Uh, this is anterior coronal, anterior coronal. Uh, here we get labial before labial, but also before a vowel. So uh, first of all, note that there is no way uh, really to get this as a natural class. Uh, without also capturing some of these segments. This is a very heterogeneous class of segments. That's a good uh, clue that this is probably the elsewhere condition. Um, and uh, what that means for a single uh, prefix, for a single morpheme, like the, the prefix alternation that we're doing here, uh, likely that elsewhere context is going to be uh, the underlying representation. So we would say that underlyingly, uh, this morpheme probably ends in a labial nasal. Uh, if you put it before a vowel, you know, whatever this morpheme is, it just surfaces faithfully, right? Because there's no reason to change that place of articulation if it's before a vowel. Um, but if you put it before, well, it looks like probably a stop, a stop, or an affricate. Uh, maybe it's before any consonant, but we can't really know that from looking at this particular data set. Uh, if you put this morpheme before uh, a stop consonant, at the very least, uh, it takes on the place of articulation of that following consonant. Right? So same underlying representation, am, um, in every single case here. But if you put it uh, before uh, some sort of a minus continuous segment at the beginning of uh, the following morpheme, it will systematically take on the place of articulation of that following uh, segment. And this is uh, nasal place assimilation. The place of articulation of the nasal um, is copying the place of articulation from the following segment. Right? This is an extremely common process in many languages all over the world in genetically unrelated, uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry, uh, language families. So uh, we don't actually have a good way of writing rules like this yet. We're going to focus on this a lot next semester when we introduce a different kind of phonological formalism. For right now, I'm going to give you an option for writing this as a rule. Um, this is not going to really figure too deeply in any of your assignments, but it's worth familiarizing yourself with it. Um, here's what I'm gonna, uh, how I'm going to write this rule. First of all, what is it targeting? Let's say it's targeting nasals. Um, you know, we don't think probably that this is, is just a property of this single morpheme. If I'm giving it to you in a phonology class, it's probably uh, more generally targeting the phonological class, which here is pretty clearly nasals. So this is the structural description of the segments that are affected by the rule, plus nasal. What's happening to them? Well, here's where we run into trouble. Um, we know that before uh, some kind of a, let's say it's a minus continuous segment, right? uh, we're not totally sure exactly uh, the natural class that triggers this, but in this problem set it looks like they're all minus continuant, assuming that affricates are minus continuant for the moment. Um, but how do we write this? It takes on the place features of whatever the place features are of the thing that comes next, we don't really have a way of doing that because this is representing a dependency structure, right? The value of these place features that we want to change is not to any fixed value. Uh, we're changing it to whatever the value is over here in the context. Here's a way to write that. Um, generally, uh, phonologists uh, 
up until the 1990s or so would do this using variables and the variables for whatever arbitrary cultural reason are usually lowercase Greek letters. This is just an arbitrary social convention in phonology. I don't really know why, uh, but in any case, we're gonna use variables here. So uh, here's alpha, the Greek letter alpha, and uh, we're gonna do this for each of the place features that we have, or at least the major place features. So alpha labial stands for whatever the value of labial is that you find over here. So I'm going to copy that index alpha labial. And what this says is that, hey, uh, take any segment that meets this structural description of being a nasal um, and uh, find the value of labial in a following non-continuant segment and copy it over here. Do the same thing for coronal and dorsal. So we're going to use the Greek letter beta for our second variable. And uh, we're gonna use the Greek letter gamma for our third one here, gamma dorsal. Okay, um, so this is a way to write this as a rule. It's not particularly pretty. We've just had to introduce this entirely new variable notation. There's a ton of features in here that have to change, right? I've said that this is one of the most common phonological processes in the world's languages. Um, so it's a little bit concerning that this is so hard to write in our theory. Um, it sort of suggests that this is a pretty complex rule that should be complex to learn, yet that doesn't seem to be the case at all, at least if we judge by the frequency with which this occurs in natural languages. So I'm going to leave that as a mystery for the moment. We're going to look at this in excruciating detail next semester in the advanced phonology class uh, if you end up taking that, um, but let it just be known that uh, Place assimilation in particular um, is pretty hard to write in our rule-based notation. Uh, and uh, nasal place assimilation, as well as other kinds of place assimilation, are some of the most common basic uh, phonological rules in the world's languages, as well as other assimilation rules. So if you sort of track down and list out every single rule of phonology that's ever been attested in every language, you'll find that some giant proportion of them, like certainly more than half are assimilation rules, uh, but it's kind of hard to write assimilation rules in this framework. This is the best option I have for you right now. Use variables to bind each of these features together. The place one is particularly bad because we have three separate place of articulation features uh, and they all need to change and match up uh, in order to get this rule to work. So this is a little bit of a conundrum in our rule-based framework. Why is it so hard to write assimilation rules and place assimilation rules in particular? Nevertheless, we think that this is what's going on uh, in the language. There's a nasal assimilation process where nasals assimilate and place features to a following stop. Um, the rule as it's currently written would also apply before a nasal. Obviously, we need to look at more data from Kawasati to see whether that's true or not. If we wanted to avoid that prediction, how could we limit this to being just oral stops? Well, we could either use the minus nasal feature or the minus sonorant feature. So the sort of shortcut I taught you for uh, plosive stops, oral stops, is minus sonorant, minus continuant. Uh, of course, if you specify this minus nasal, that would also limit it to the oral stops. Um, <clears throat> Underlying representation uh, pretty clearly has a mu in it, and these other uh, final consonants in the other allomorphs are derived by predictable phonological rule. Right? Good. Uh, one more example from Diophonie reduplication. And what is reduplication? Well, normally, at least in languages like English and Spanish and uh, you know, Russian and German and uh, whatever, the languages that are spoken in this classroom, for the most part, uh, you have uh, a suffix or a prefix, and it comes with a phonological underlying representation that's just memorized in the lexicon. Uh, and then when you want to put that morpheme into a word, you take that phonological form, you put it into the word. Uh, but reduplicants are a little bit different. Uh, they're instead stored in the lexicon, not with phonological features, 
uh, but with some sort of a morphological feature or structure that says, uh, take whatever you attach to and copy it. So if you attach the reduplicant to ba, then it's going to come out ba, ba, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, there's, this would be total reduplication, where you take the entire morpheme it attaches to and copy that entire morpheme over. There's also various kinds of partial reduplication, where if this were bata, maybe you just take the first syllable and make it ba bata. Uh, it works differently in different languages, but this is the basic thing that reduplication is. It's a morpheme that copies something from the other morphemes it attaches to. Um, and so what I'm going to be showing you here um, is a couple different reduplicants in Jolophonie. Um, and the question here uh, is going to be what are the underlying representations of the morphemes here and how do they alternate? And what's a little bit tricky is that because this is a reduplication process, rather than looking at different forms to see how a morpheme changes in different contexts, we're going to have multiple copies of the same morpheme in each word here because one of those copies is a base uh, that is a basic morpheme and the second copy is going to be the reduplicated form of that base. Now in Jolophonie, as in many other languages that have reduplication, it's a little bit tricky to see which one is the base and which one is the reduplicant uh, because, you know, you never know uh, if you have two things next to each other that both have the same phonological form. It's hard to say which is the base and which is the reduplicant. It doesn't really matter for the particular problem set that we're doing right now. Um, but yeah, so the first step here, morphological segmentation, is going to be a little bit tricky, all right? because uh, we want to figure out where the boundary is between the base and the reduplicant between the original morpheme and its copied form for each of these. Okay, so let's break it down here. In the first word, uh, we have here ni gang gum. Um, and I've told you that this is a reduplicated form, so what uh, would be uh, the thing that's uh, copied or doubled in here? Well, uh, it looks like it's going to be uh, certainly the ga part is exactly the same here and here. Um, and there's a final nasal in both of these, so a good guess would be that if the base and the reduplicant are next to each other, that one of them is gang and one of them is gum. So this is already showing us an alternation. Uh, what it's showing us uh, is that uh, the same morpheme takes on two different phonological forms when it's in different phonological contexts. Uh, those contexts happen to be right next to each other in the same word in this particular case. So just to be clear here, these were meant to be like boundary markers, not segments. Um, so what do we see here? Well, it looks like the difference is going to be in this final nasal. Once again, I've already told you that this problem is, is another uh, version of the Kawasaki one, so that's kind of unsurprising. Um, and so what we're going to want to track, again, is what the place of articulation of this final nasal is uh, in different contexts. Right? Uh, and so uh, for this one, let's track... Uh, by context rather than by allomorph. You could do it either way, but I think it's going to be a little bit clearer if we separate by context. So what do I mean by that? Well, this context for this nasal is going to be before a velar stop. And we know, presumably, that place of articulation is going to be important here. So let's say before a dorsal, what do we get here? Engma. This one is word final. So this context will be preceding a word boundary. What do we get here? Ma. Let's try this for some of the other ones. Next one, kubombon. So word final, again, it looks like we have a copied syllable here, which is uh, bom and bon. Uh, bon. Uh, so uh, word finally, we get the coronal one here, uh, but then before a labial, uh, 
we get, oh, I should have taken up less space when I was doing this. Let me erase this one. What happens before a labial consonant? We get a labial nasal. And you can already presumably start to see what's going on here. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Natin ding. So at the here's the word final, we get a velar one, but before a coronal consonant, uh, before t, we get a coronal nasal. Um, and what else? Fam fun. Well, because I don't want to put another context up here, I will just say fam fun shows you uh, a, another word final coronal nasal. Um, but before a labiodental fricative, you get a labiodental nasal. That's what that funny little hook on the M character means. Um, Namimine. Uh, so word final, again, we get this coronal one. But before a labial, we get the labial one. Uh, uh Similarly here, uh, word finally, we get the uh, coronal. But before a dorsal consonant, here it's a nasal. We get a dorsal. Um, so all of these are basically showing us the same thing. There's also a palatal example. That C letter in the IPA is a palatal stop, ch. Um, and before a palatal stop, we get a palatal nasal, uh, even though at the end of the word it is uh, velar and so on and so forth. So uh, here, the morphological segmentation was a little bit tricky. And the tracking of allomorphs um, was also a little bit tricky because we're having to keep track for each word uh, what's its place of articulation of the final sound when it's at the end of the word versus the place of articulation of a final sound when it's preceding some kind of a consonant. But what we're seeing here is that in the context where a nasal uh, precedes a consonant, uh, and this in this case is a stop, a fricative, or a nasal in geophonie, so it's really anything with this place of articulation, uh, the nasal, again, copies the place of articulation of that following sound, right? Uh, whereas uh, at the end of a word, it looks like different nasals are just in free contrast. So there's a contrast for place of articulation here uh, in this word final context. Uh, that seems to be listed in the lexicon. So this is going to be a case of what kind of a distribution? This is a case of positional neutralization. So in word final position, and presumably before a vowel, I think we can see that in the problem set as well, um, you get a contrast, at least a three-way contrast, between uh, labial, coronal, and velar nasal sounds. But before a following consonant, that contrast neutralizes, and the place of, our sim of assimilation uh, is whatever the place of the following consonants are. So before a dorsal consonant, you can't have a contrast between a dorsal and a labial nasal. All the nasals in this context are predictably uh, velar or dorsal themselves. That's why it's a positional neutralization distribution. Um, so again, we're going to approach this very similarly to the Kawasaki example. Here, let me try some OT constraints um, just to try to show you how this uh, kind of works. And the basic idea here, um, we'll assume that by the time we get to the input of the phonology, uh, that this reduplication process has already operated and we have two copies of the morpheme. Um, so how would this work, for instance, um, in the case of uh, coup bonbon? Uh, well, I don't know whether coup is a separate morpheme or not. I'll just assume it isn't for the moment, but eh, maybe I'll assume it is, just to uh, make it clear what's being copied here. Um, and we just said that uh, word finally, uh, the place of the nasal consonant is unpredictable and contrastive and must be listed in the lexicon. Therefore, we would expect the underlying representation of this morpheme uh, to end in n, because that's what we see at the end of the word here, and that's not predictable. So both copies of the morpheme have the same underlying representation. 
And uh, our job now is going to be to explain why this one changes. Uh, we can do that because we've just figured out that in this context, the place of articulation of this nasal is a predictable function of the following consonant. Um, so in OT to do assimilation, there's a couple different options. We looked at this briefly for voicing assimilation, also very common across the world's languages. Um, and the constraint, uh, that family that we're going to use to do this is, is what I refer to as an agree constraint. So here it looks like um, any kind of a uh, nasal uh, consonant is assimilating in place to a following nasal consonant. In terms of an agree constraint, uh, we might write that as agree takes two arguments. The first one uh, says, what's the natural class of segments that have to agree? And as far as we can tell in this uh, particular problem set from, uh, excuse me, Jolophon Yi, this is basically any consonant. So we're not seeing any clusters of two consonants that don't agree in place of articulation. So let's say that anything that's plus consonantal, and that could be changed if we got further data showing us that it's more limited, has to agree in all the place features. So we could list out uh, labial, coronal, and dorsal here. As an abbreviation, I'm just going to put place, or maybe major place. Uh, and this allows us to get all the different assimilation scenarios in one uh, kind of a constraint here. This says that uh, hey, if you are a Jolophony uh, <coughs> sequence of two plus consonantal items, then you'd better agree in your major place features. Um, again, this is sort of showing us that there's something a little bit funny about our feature theory where we can't just write major place with a single feature, but instead we broke it into three different features in our theory. Um, this is making it difficult to do place assimilation. We're going to basically start with that problem next semester. But for right now, we'll just abbreviate it major place. So we have this agreement constraint. Um, and uh, in this particular case, uh, that's going to be a kind of markedness constraint that says, hey, on the surface, you can't have uh, this two combinations of features like this. Um, and so in OT, you'd want to be able to um, explain why the output here is assimilated bon, bon, uh, rather than say uh, surfacing faithfully, preserving its input features. Um, how are we going to do that? Well, um, if we're neutralizing a contrast, right, then uh, we're going to need to have that positional markedness constraint high ranked. I'll call this agree place as a shortcut. The full version is the one I just wrote on the board. Um, and that's going to need to be ranked in particular above the requirement that you keep your place features that you surfaced with, excuse me, that you have in your underlying representation in the lexicon. So again, I'll abbreviate the three relevant constraints here, coronal, labial, and dorsal, with ident place. Um, and uh, we know because there's a positional neutralization uh, in Joe Lafonyi that this positional markedness constraint is a higher priority than preserving input features. If it weren't, then we'd get contrast uh, in this particular context where there's two adjacent consonants. We don't get contrast there. Therefore, the markedness constraint must be high ranked. This guy does not obey it because it has a sequence of two plus consonantal sounds that don't agree for their major place features. Um, and so this guy wins, even though it changes the underlying place of articulation features of this nasal, which was coronal in the input. Because this constraint doesn't apply to word final nasals, uh, the contrast gets left alone at the end of a word, uh, and you end up with uh, faithful uh, place features surfacing at the end of a word. In other words, contrast at the end of a word. Right? Uh, so that's a sort of sketch of an analysis. Um, this agreement schema for uh, uh, assimilation constraints for OT is going to figure in one of your homeworks. So it's worth keeping in mind, this is the best option we have for now. 
uh, of representing assimilation processes in OT.